Well, hello everyone. Um, it's lovely to see everyone here and thank you for supporting this event. My name is Gassia Uzunian. I'm the music fellow at LMH and I'm one of the organizers of this series along with Justin Holder, Katrina Palmer, Dilar Direk and Nadine Esline. Uh, this is the final event in this year's Black Histories and Futures series at Lady Margaret Hall. We've hosted seven events this year, which have been very warmly attended and very generously supported by the college. Uh, so we wish to extend a thanks to the college for all of their support um, and to everyone who's made this series possible, in particular our communications office and our bursar's office, and especially Joe Murray and Tom Hughes. Um, and I also wish to thank Jared Gormley who helped with the sound recording for tonight. It's um, a real honor to present Dr. Samantha Age, a pianist and musicologist and the Lord Crew Junior Research Fellow at Lincoln College in Oxford. Dr. Ege has been making waves with her recordings and her scholarship, which focuses on women's contributions to concert life in the first half of the 20th century. Tonight, Dr. Ege will perform and discuss the works of Florence Price in conversation with LMH principal Alan Respiger. Um, and I also wished to extend a very warm thanks to them both. Um, and uh, just to say that Alan has also been a wonderful supporter of the series and of musical life at LMH. Welcome to Samantha and to Alan. Well, it's such a pleasure and um, it's such a treat to um, be introduced to this fabulous new music that we're, we're going to hear in, in, in 20 minutes. But um, um, I, I thought I'd just begin by, I, I, I've um, been, I'm afraid, delving into your life um, via, via your blog. Um, and it, it's a fascinating musical journey. And I wonder if you could just summarize what what your musical education was like and why it suddenly changed in the year that you were at McGill? So I had been playing the piano for most of my life. Um, I don't really remember a time when I didn't play. And during that time, I played a lot of familiar names, Beethoven, Brahms, Bach, etc. And this to me was just very standard in terms of my music education. And it wasn't until my second undergraduate year when I was an exchange student at McGill University in Canada, that I learned of a very different narrative in classical music, one that had not been introduced to me before, and that was that women existed in this history. And this was the first time that I heard the music of Florence Price. And I had never known of any black women in classical music before. And so this really opened my eyes to new ways of being and existing in classical music. And it really changed everything um, in terms of how I would go on to approach classical music as both a pianist and a musicologist. I, I think you, you, you wrote that when you were a teenager, you, you flirted with Scott Joplin, but, but your music teacher was rather severe and said, that, 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 don't bother with that, you know, we, we, you stick to Beethoven. Yes, there was a sense in which Scott Joplin wasn't proper music. Um, and so that sense of, you know, what is considered proper and what isn't um, was reinforced basically with a lot of the repertoire that I studied. And so hearing Florence Price's music and hearing something quite familiar in her style, um, but also quite new was just incredibly intriguing. And it really pushed me to want to know more basically. I mean, from from reading up about Florence Price in, in recent days, she, she's not a wholly forgotten um, figure, but but a pretty a pretty forgotten figure. So, what was the what was the event in in McGill that suddenly got onto your radar? Well, I was in um, a music course, learning about twentieth century music, and. I, I remember listening to a piece called Fantasy Negre in E minor. And this is a piece where Florence Price is using a, a very romantic style, um, which was very familiar to me as a pianist because of the kinds of works that I had played. But she's also drawing influence from the spiritual, from the sound world of the enslaved. And this was something that I hadn't heard in classical music before. And I was just really blown away by how she was able to synthesize um, these two worlds and worlds that have 
sort of been taught to me as being separate, going back to, you know, the Scott Joplin example of one type of music being um, proper and the other, you know, being inappropriate. Can we just sketch, sketch her life? So she was, she was born in the, the same place that Bill Clinton was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and, um, uh, and, uh, and then went to train classically in, in Boston. Um, what, what, that, I mean, how unusual was that as a, as a, as a young aspiring black musician to, to go to a, a, a conservatoire in, in, in Boston? There can't have been many conservatoires that, that would, would take young black women at that point. Yes, there, there weren't very many conservatoires that accepted black students and the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston was an exception. I think one of the things to understand about Florence Price is that she was from a relatively privileged class. And so the idea of someone of her class stature going on to um, to a conservatoire was not out of the ordinary. And so she, she was, um, well, she was one of the few black students in her cohort, but what's interesting is that she passed as Mexican. Um, she described her nationality as being Mexican during her time there. And so that indicates to us, you know, the complexities of, of navigating um, classical music as someone of African descent, but in a in a Jim Crow, you know, context. Okay, and 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 can you give us a sense of what kind of um, musical education should have had a completely straightforward Western inspired musical education, or uh, I suppose largely European uh, musical education? Yes, yes, because the New England New England Conservatory was basically created in the image of the European Conservatoire, and the idea was to give American citizens the kinds of education that they could get abroad, but the idea was to be able to provide that at home. And so she had the kind of training that is familiar to many classical musicians. But what's really interesting is that she didn't go to the Conservatoire as a composer. She, she went there to study organ performance and piano pedagogy. And during that time though, she was composing and she actually took her compositions to the director of the conservatoire. And one of the compositions that she took used these spiritual influences that we hear in her music. And so what that tells us is that around the age of 16, 17, 18, she was already exploring this language that um, would become this signature part of her style. And do you imagine that a bit like you were told, don't bother with Scott Joplin, her teachers in Boston would have said, that's very interesting, but that's, that's not what we're here to teach you. Well, actually the director was very impressed with her style and the director was um, on the record as saying that actually um, black folk music has no place in American music. Um, but clearly he, he changed his stance. And I, I do wonder how, um, how Florence Price's music might have had um, an impact in, in changing his, his views around that. Can, can we introduce Dvorak here? Yes. Because uh, <laughs> I, I read a quote of, uh, from Dvorak round about the time that she must have been in, in, in Boston. And he wrote, I'm now satisfied that the future of music in this country must be founded upon what we are called, what, 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 what are called the Negro melodies. In them, I discover all that is needed for a great and noble school of music. There's nothing in the whole range of composition that cannot be supplied with themes from this source. So I, I wonder whether that sort of feeling about spirituals and, and folk music was beginning to permeate if you had a sort of great figure like Dvorak writing in those terms at that period. I think what's important to remember though is that there were black classical composers who already were using black folk songs as inspiration for their craft and so I think Dvorak really amplified what was already happening and there was certainly backlash where um, many white composers were completely against this idea um, and especially if we consider the times that they were living in, um, it, it complicated ideas of nationality and citizenship in classical music. And so 
Price definitely um, was empowered by by Dvorak's statements, but there were also um, black composers like Burley and and Scott Joplin and um, many others who were familiar to her that um, were already you know already exploring this and um, providing examples for her to draw from. If we draw the lens back a, a, a tiny bit further again. Um reading Alex Ross on this period um, uh, in general about American music. Um, he, he, he said to tell the story of American composition in the early 20th century is to circle around an absent center. The great African-American or orchestral works that Dvorak predicted are mostly absent. The landscape teems with interesting life, but, um, but then he talks about the, the fact that all composers um, were deemed that, that American, so-called American music was deemed inessential by the Beethoven besotted concert goers of the urban center. So I suppose he's trying to, he, he talks about a kind of non-identity um, so that all composers were struggling with this sort of European weight uh, and that American composers were struggling to find a voice. Is, is that a fair summary of the, the period you're studying? I think on the one hand, yes, but in, in terms of the composers that I study, like Florence Price, Margaret Bonds, Nora Holt, um, William Grant Still, I don't hear that struggle. I find that these composers are very sure of what they want to say musically. I think that their, their wider audience struggle with, um, with accepting such a bold statement of identity during that time. Um, but in Florence Price's music, and as I wrote in my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, that she finds resolution and she finds a way to bring together the seemingly dissonant aspects of her identity. And again, you'll forgive me because I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in very sort of simplistic terms, but listening to, the, to some of the composers that you play and mention, there's, there seems to be sort of two, two strands. One, one is the other composers who go down, as it were, the folk strand, um, and uh, I, I guess um, Price is mainly on in that route. And then there are others, um, this amazing composer, Nora Holt, who, whose work Almost Nothing Survives, but that went down the sort of jazz, the jazz strand. So you've got um, the, these two options of, 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 of musical tradition. Yes, I mean, I, I would say that actually the, um, the identities that we hear are quite kaleidoscopic. And that's something that I really look at with um, my new album, which is called Fantasy Neg Piano Music of Florence Price, where I am demonstrating this folkloric influence, but I also want to show the versatility of Price's expression and um, the vastness of her musical training as well. And, and just because we're, we're about to hear two pieces and I'd, I'd love you to talk in, in a minute specifically about these two pieces, but given given all that we've talked about so far the the the, the voice the, the the inspiration and her training can you sort of prepare the audience for the sound world that they're about to hear because because it is it's very romantic um but 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 how do you explain the the, the sound world in terms of of what she would have been taught about european music and how she's attempted to um ally this with a with a completely different tradition so the first piece that you're going to hear is Florence Price's sonata in E minor and you're going to hear the first movement which follows a very conventional form so there's an introduction and Florence Price is great at writing these big bold introductions that really assert you know that she's here um, and then you're going to hear a theme um, in the key of E minor. This is the first theme. And the theme is actually an original theme that she has composed herself, but it evokes the sound world of the spiritual. So she's using a scale, a five note scale um, called the pentatonic scale, which you hear a lot in African-American folk songs. So she's using that to craft 
the first theme that you'll hear. And then there's a second theme that's in a, the key of C major, which is a lot more mellow. So you're going to hear a contrast there. And then she, she demonstrates um, just how masterful a technician she is by developing these themes. And so we're going to go on, a, on an adventure through these different ideas. And then she comes back to the main theme in E minor. So you really get a sense of beginning, middle and end. With the second piece that you're going to hear, that's the fantasy neck number three in F minor. And this was one where um, it was noted as being incomplete. And I was very determined to find the rest of it. Um, and so I went to the University of Arkansas in the summer of 2019, which is where the Florence Price archives are. I saw the first two pages of the piece of music and I couldn't find anything else. And so I really had to think, OK, what might Florence Price say next? And so I was looking for clues in her choice of key, in her melody and all of the, the characteristics that I've identified. I was looking for pieces of music that might um, follow on from the first two pages. So you're going to hear my reconstruction of this third fantasy. Brilliant. Well, look, shall we? Shall we uh, I mean, let, let's hear the music now and then. Um... Uh, if you if if people can put in chat as I mean I don't want to people to chat and um, as it were listen to the music but but if you, if you can um, as you're listening to these extraordinary pieces if you can think of what you would like to ask at the end uh, and that, then we'll come back and we'll talk further at the end Samantha but but thank you for that and, and, and initial setting up of the picture uh, and and we'll continue the conversation having heard these um, these two pieces.
Wow, I was going to say you need a drink after that, but you you haven't just played it, so you. Uh, <laughs> it's still um, exhausting, all the same, just to watch. So. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I hadn't realised you were playing that in LMH. That, how did you find the LMH piano? Yes, it's a, it's a gorgeous piano. It's a Steinway, so yeah. It's lovely, lovely. to let, let rip on a on a huge instrument like that. No, well, that was absolutely wonderful, Samantha, and and um, re revelatory of, of of the music and 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 beautifully played. Can you give us the dates of those two pieces so that we, we have a bit more context? Yes, 1932 for both of them. Right. And just a bit more context. Um, the, 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 we, we speak of the Chicago Black Renaissance in music at the time. Just, just tell us what shape that took. So the, the Black Chicago Renaissance was an era of cultural rebirth that was galvanized as thousands of African-Americans headed to the urban North and West to create new possibilities for themselves, essentially. And so in the arts, we, we witness these incredible transformations. Um, and this, the pieces that you heard fit into that era of um, really wonderful creativity. And in fact, um, the first piece that you heard was submitted for a contest that was specifically for African-American composers called the Wanamaker Music Contests. Um, my theory is also that the other piece was submitted for that contest too. Um, and so this was to really encourage more um, composition um, from African-American practitioners. This is the sort of the, the, the migration that Isabel Wilkinson has been writing about recently, isn't it? Of the, of the, the people who headed north to because the, the position in the south was so grim. And then this extraordinary thing, uh, she her first symphony was premiered in 1933 with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Tell, tell us about how that happened. Yes. So um, within Florence Price's network was a woman called Maud Roberts George, and she was um, a, a society woman very well known throughout Chicago. And she entered a contract with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra so that Florence Price's music could be performed. Um, and this was groundbreaking because this was the first time that an all white, all male um, ensemble of, you know, a hugely renowned stature had um, brought in the music of a black woman into their repertoire. Can you can you sketch? Because I again reading up, there were there were four symphonies, weren't there? And there was a piano concerto and a violin concerto. But in the end, she heads back to Arkansas. Is that right? No, she remained in Chicago. She, she remains in Chicago. Her. But 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 is it a story of? of unfulfilled, I mean, did the kinds of prejudice kick in that, that meant that she never quite agreed to, uh, achieved the glory that she should have done? W to tell us about the rest of her life. Well, she really wanted her works to be recognized in Boston and that never happened during her lifetime. I think that there are certainly instances of triumph in her life where, um, you know, she made her symphonic debut in 1933 with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Marian Anderson sang her music on the world stage. And we, we see particularly within um, the black female network of practitioners in Chicago, that there are real moments of joy and uplift and triumph there. I think where, um, where she faces barriers are certainly with the white mainstream, um, not always accepting her work, um, but hopefully uh, we're, we're beginning to see a change now. I was, I was going to say, what, what, what are the signs that she's now being accepted and that, that her, her, her body of work is going to achieve more performances, it, not only her piano work, but her symphonic work, her choral works? Well, we're seeing more recordings and obviously my recording adds to that. Um, there are many Price scholars emerging, um, um, a Kari Hill is here. Um, hello, Kari. And we are working on, you know, bringing um, certain aspects of Price's narrative to the fore. Um, and we're building on the work that's been done before us as well. So even though Price is entering mainstream consciousness again, um, we must recognize that there have been so many um, musicologists and um, instrumentalists championing her work from Price's lifetime up until the present moment. So actually that there has been a very um, steady and dedicated 
cohort around her work.